Welcome to Making the Cut Podcast with Chris Hill and Sean Winner, where we help you succeed in life and business by sharing principles and strategies that guide some of the most successful people in the world. Welcome to episode 34 of the Making the Cut Podcast. I'm Chris Hill with my co-host, Sean Winner. Today on the show, we have celebrity chef, TV personality, and food entrepreneur, Aaron McCargo Jr. But before jumping into that conversation, here's a quick word from our sponsor. The Cordon Bleu is considered to be synonymous with outstanding quality, setting standards in both the culinary arts and the hospitality industry for over 120 years. If you want to set yourself apart from the competition and prepare for a career of exciting opportunities, learn from the best of new world innovation and cuisine with the principles, techniques, and artistry of French traditions. Apply now at cordonbleu.edu. And we are one week away from closing the Plate It Like You Mean It contest with our prize provider, Oneida Food Service. This is where one lucky winner will receive a full tabletop installation for their upcoming or current food business. And not only that, three other winners will be selected to receive prize packages of tabletop products valued at $10,000, $5,000, and $2,000. It is one of the biggest contests that Entrepreneurial Chef has run to date. So don't delay. Seven days left. Submit your photo at entrepreneurialchef.com forward slash Oneida. Enter and be on the lookout to see if you won. And speaking of contest, Chris, we're connecting with Aaron McCargo. He was the winner of the Food Network contest, right? That's right. You know, actually, that was one of the seasons of Food Network Star that I watched. Uh, Aaron, he's got a great, big, bubbly personality. So this should be a, a really fun conversation. If you don't know Aaron McCargo Jr., he was the winner of the next Food Network star and subsequently starred in his own show, Big Daddy's House, which aired for seven seasons on the Food Network. With appearances on variety hit shows, it's safe to say McCargo has a God-given talent that the world has readily embraced. Despite the myriad of success McCargo experienced thus far, words like humble, honest, and humorous are just a few ways to describe this renowned chef. Sean, I'm looking forward to this. Where do you say we hop in? Yeah, looking forward to catching up with him again. Let's do it. Chef Aaron McCargo Jr., how's it going today? Good, man. How about yourself? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, I know a lot of our listeners are familiar with you, know your story. You've definitely seen that nice big smile of yours. But maybe you could give a little bit of background, uh, a quick, a brief history of, of your life get leading up to here. Well, um, I, I got to first say um, it always starts with God. He gave me an amazing gift that I, and great parents to helped me figure out what I was going to do with my life. Like a lot of kids and a lot of young adults, um, you're struggling with listening to folks try to drive you into what they think you should become or what area of your life you should be focusing on to be a great person. But I've always loved cooking. I had a passion for cooking and I didn't know what a passion for cooking was or food um, at a young age. I just knew I loved being around the smells, the textures, the taste of food. And my father was able to look at that and see that this was something potentially that I can make a living off of. And he just continued to tell me that, um, you know, I was going to be a chef. I was going to be able to make a lot of people happy with my food. And from the age of four or five years old, starting with the Easy Bake Oven to seven years old, to um, really getting in the kitchen and dibbling and dabbling with food to pursuing it throughout school. Um, it was kind of tough in the beginning. Um, being from Camden, New Jersey, you know, it wasn't the most likely and popular thing to be wanting to cook because in the early 80s, um, it wasn't thought to be something that anyone and everyone was looking to get into. So I had to really persevere through a lot and go through a lot of abuse and bullying and things of that nature uh, just because of what I love to do. And no one really understood my my drive and my love for food and for cooking and making people happy. So, um, you know, I stuck with it and went through high school and attempted culinary school. And I realized that my take on food and culinary schools were totally different. Um, I, I know that they're there to teach us and to show us, you know, the basics and the fundamentals of cooking. But I knew that I had my own taste that I wanted to share with the world. And and here I am. And so, Aaron, even at a young age, you were an entrepreneur. Weren't you selling cakes in school, in high school, all the way back when? Was that kind of where, where you started testing the water with that? Yes, yes. It's funny because um, I remember in the ninth or tenth grade, uh, my mom was like, hey, you got to get out the house and do something. And I was just reading cookbooks, watching Yang Kang cook, Julia Child, uh, you name it. Uh, and, oh, I can't uh, forget. Um, oh, I can't think of his name for the life of me, but he's one of my favorites. But um, 
you know, I, I just kept watching culinary programs and TV shows off of PBS. And my mom's like, there's a Wilton K class uh, happening at JCPenney's. You need to go sign up for it. And I really didn't want to do it, but the cake thing um, I was interested in. So I wound up taking the class. I was like this little bald black dude. No, I had a fro at the time. And it was like 50 old white women looking at me like, what, are, what is he doing here? And before you know it, in two weeks, they're like my mother, my grandmother, my auntie. And they're looking for me to come in. And when I didn't come in, they were chastising me. And I took that Wilton class and I turned it into a cake business and started selling cakes um, at school and people, the drug dealers, the, the neighbors, everyone was interested in, and knowing that there was a baker in the city. And I was the guy that was just making cakes from my home and, and selling to whoever was willing to buy them. That's one of the best stories you've heard on this uh, podcast so far. <laughs> <laughs> That's real talk, brother. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, so maybe you can fill us in a little bit on your career from maybe the time when you tried out culinary school and didn't seem like a good fit to maybe leading up to the Food Network days? Well, it's funny because my mentor at the time, um, I, I was working at a, a private club in Camden, and I was like a bar bag houseman, just setting up rooms and things of that nature. And this, I got into the kitchen. I met the chef. He was a real strong-headed, tough guy. And, and I was telling him I love cooking. And he was like, well, you got to prove yourself. And I believe that's something that we've gotten away from. And hopefully we can touch on that today. But there's no, it was, it was a matter of proving myself that I really had passion. I wanted to do it. So he was throwing at me all the grunt work, like peeling four 50 pound bags of potatoes, cleaning four or five cases of chicken breast, skinning and filleting salmon, whole salmons and things of that nature. And I'm like, this isn't cooking. And, but he taught me that if you really love it, you're willing to put in the time and do the work. Um, as far as the prep is concerned. And, you know, I, at the culinary school, I came back to the, the, um, the, the club and he hired me as a cook and gave me that same treatment. No um, preferential treatment being that I was from culinary school because it was a school of hard knocks working in the kitchen. And from there on, um, he moved on. He had a, a position as a executive chef at the steakhouse. He brought me on and I was his sous chef. And then he moved on and I became an executive chef. And then wherever he went, um, I followed and then folks started to hear about me. And then I wound up being one of these guys that people really didn't hire for uh, like this real fancy foo foo foodie thing that we didn't know about back in the nineties or the two early 2000s. It was more about me making sure that we had a trained staff on consistent product, good tasting product, and we had our own identity. And I just kept growing um, in the restaurant industry uh, through my reputation as being a guy that was committed to the game and passionate. And then eventually I winded up owning my own two restaurants and um, I made that big mistake, which I warn anyone, take your time, do one at a time. There's no rush. And I thought that at the time, if I can get them all going um, and be successful, then that would be great for me to, to grow this whole big enterprise. And uh, it actually stressed me out. It was I made a lot of mistakes um, in opening my business. I didn't have the right tutoring or support. Uh, financial support is big. Of course, I'm sure you guys know when you start a restaurant, but um, I learned from the mistakes. I got out of it. I needed a break. My, a buddy of mine told me that Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia was hiring, looking for a chef of catering. And I said, okay, well, I've done a lot of catering, but I didn't want to go to the nine to five. I was like, something about when you put in 12, 13, 14 hours a day, pleasing people, working with a crew that's got your back, the dishwashers that are rocking out, it drives your blood. It drives your adrenaline. It's, it's like an, it's a, it's an addiction. Um, and I didn't know if I can get rid of that addiction, but I needed to support my family. I took the job and I had a great boss, a female boss, Mary Grant. I will never forget her. Um, she let me do who I am and, and, and create the food that, that I thought would be great food for the catering. And I heard my wife tell me that there's a looking, um, a show called Next Food Network Star, and they're looking for the next TV personality. And I'm a pretty to myself type guy. You know, a lot of folks can't believe it, but I pretty much don't like crowds. And still to the day, I, I, I pretty much stay to myself. But she thought that with my food, uh, my personality, we always did little gatherings at our crib and, and people just came over and I just did what I wanted to do with food and got funky with it. And we applied and before you know it, I was selected went on the show and competed, gave my best, prayed every day, trusted God that I was going to win. I had no other option but to win. And here I am. 
Wow, that's incredible. Side note, when you said that you're an introvert, which a lot of people won't believe, I actually just read a study that some of the top athletes and in, in public figures, the majority of them are introverts. Who would have really? thought? Yeah, yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> so I'm not crazy. <laughs> no, you're not crazy. Yeah. Which yeah. makes sense. Which makes sense really because you think that's probably a, in a in a big way how they are able to focus on their craft. Yes. Yes. Chris, you just hit the nail on the head. That was one of the differentiating factors is that they blocked out the noise. They weren't involved in some of those social groups, if you will. And they just focused on their craft and they got to their, quote, 10,000 hours faster than anybody else. So, Aaron, let, I want to dial it back for a second. It sounded like you 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 were shooting for the moon you wanted this enterprise you learned some tough lessons and that you kind of alluded to can you talk a little bit about what you went through and the lessons that you learned in some of those tough parts well um you know it's funny because it started off with a childhood friend of mine who believed in me since kindergarten and and funny to say like we were still we're still great friends today and he was like mccargo let's open up something i want to support you and you know, I never had anyone come to me, first of all, to say they believed in me, that they wanted to, to put their money behind an idea or concept um, of an eatery. And sure enough, in Camden, New Jersey, you don't come out with, oh, I'm going to have people sit down and enjoy a ribeye steak sandwich with horseradish cream sauce and arugula and sun-dried tomatoes. That just doesn't jump off. And he was really skeptical about the things I wanted to show folks and to, to, to sell, to put on the menu. But he said, McCargo, if you believe you can do this, man, I got the money, I'll back you. And he was in software and he's like, let's do it. And sure enough, we found a location. It was a turnkey operation. I kept most of the staff that was there. Um, the thieves, I had to cut loose. I don't do the still in line or cheating thing. Um, I sniffed them out in the beginning. That was one of my things that was hard because I learned that to run your own business, you have to really be a prick in so many ways. You got to really stick to your grounds and you got to really surround yourself with people that have the same type of ethics as you and really believe in doing things the right way. So that was my first hard lesson. And then I didn't realize all the behind the scenes because when you're a chef in a restaurant, you're holding, keeping food costs and you're hiring staff and writing schedules and stuff. That's, that's different. But when you have to worry about the purveyors coming in and you got to worry about accounts receivables and all that stuff and payroll, that's a whole nother monkey uh, on your back that you really need someone to help you with. And I was pretty much trying to solo do it. And I was excited because the people were coming in, digging the grub, loving the vibe, loving the atmosphere, respecting the food, didn't have any, you know, gripes about the pricing. But the business aspect of it was really tough because that's one of the things I didn't really want to do in this industry. And most chefs, um, I was, maybe I'm wrong about this, but most chefs in this industry, we choose our battles. Some want to be behind the scenes. They want to work on the paperwork and they want to be in the office. Some want to be in, in, in the trenches and with the crew and, and jamming it out. And now I'm that type of guy, but, um, they taught me some lessons. You got to learn business. You got to learn food costs, not just from a kitchen perspective, but you got to learn how to balance the books and everything else. If you're going to do this solo or get yourself someone that can back you. And secondly, having enough financing because, um, paying the high rents, uh, gas, electric, payroll taxes, sales tax, all these things were, and paying yourself, um, weren't on the radar, you know? So I thought paying my staff good would be something to keep them happy and keep me from having turnover because I know turnover is a big problem in this industry. And when you have turnover, you have a lot of failures and less success, but I've never paid myself, which caused me to have problems at home because I wasn't bringing anything into my house to help support my family. And my wife wasn't, you know, feeling that. She just couldn't take it, you know, after a year or two, the constant bringing home the void checks wasn't doing it. And then the little $200 I was trying to pay myself definitely wasn't covering even a cable bill. So um, those were some of the hard lessons and understanding you can't please everybody. You know, they, they have you by the, by the ball, so to say, when they want to dictate to you when they deserve a raise and you know they're putting the work in, but... You know, you can't make everybody happy in the first six months or a year. So I, I, those are some of the tough struggles I had. And um, those are some of the tough lessons that I've, I've learned that, you know, to do it again, definitely think this through, have financial backing um, that can sustain you for over a year and make sure that you keep your numbers and everything tighter. Some great advice. Yeah. For anyone listening out there, I've lived through some of those personally myself too, Aaron. 
No. Get him all alone, believe me. Exactly. It's scary, man. It's really scary. It's, 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 uh, and you can't, you don't have a, um, there's no counselor. There is no uh, therapist for this. You know, you, you either have to have a, a, a spiritual based lifestyle, which is trusting God and talking to him. And at the time I was immature in my faith and I, I didn't know to, to listen more to God and, and to, to really seek him for advice and have him send me people that could have gotten me out of that situation and turned it around. But I have no regrets in life. I always say never have regrets when you're learning things. Um, just learn from them and let them sit somewhere deep in your heart and your mind so you can use them for yourself or for someone else. Yeah, I love it. You, you alluded to a, a few minutes ago, you know, talking about how we've, as an industry, kind of gotten away from, you know, you, you – get the job as a dishwasher or as an early cook and you kind of work your way up and then 10 or you know, 12, 15 years down the road, you can become an executive chef or however that might look mm-hmm. for you having worked your way up and kind of proven yourself, you know, even had your name on, on the, the sign of the restaurant and then applying for next food network star. Do you feel like that and actually having the, the kitchen chops gave you an advantage over some of the other chefs and cooks on there? Uh, no, not by far, because I never knew any of those folks before the show. So uh, until we got on the show, we started to hear each other's background. Those cats were talented. Shane, Lisa, Jeffrey, um, just to name a few. Those those guys, had, these guys had backgrounds, owning their own restaurants, um, graduating top culinary, uh, top of their culinary class, uh, had catering businesses that were successful. So I, I came in with some high caliber folks. See, a lot of folks don't believe it when they look at those shows. They think they're just some like home cooks, but they brought the big guns out in that season, season four, next food network star. And I didn't know what to expect. And I never come in with this ego. Like I'm the best and everyone has to, to meet my standards. I come in always as, Hey, I, I'm at the bottom of the talent pole and I got to work myself up and prove myself, not to anyone, but to myself that I have the cooking chops and the ability to, to do what I say I can do. So Definitely, it wasn't no uh, advantage um, whatsoever having my name because a lot of those folks have had the same accomplishments. Some of the individuals that may see your success, it's it's good to hear the timeline and the evolution that you went through because there's and I'm not I don't want to pick on any particular authors, but there's there's books out there about turning. How should I say this without saying the name of the author's book, but <laughs> about how to make X amount of money and X amount of time and all, you know, this, this, this kind of like overnight success mentality and instant gratification mentality, your mm. evolution was, was a decade plus in the making for you to be able to sit back and say, wow, I'm, I actually have solid footing, right? Yes. Yes. And that's the dues paying part. And I think that when you count hours and times and you make this five year, 10 year plan, or, you know, you, it, it throws things off and it sets you up for a, a big failure because you, you really try to stick to this timeline. And I didn't have any um, set goals. I just knew that I love cooking and I wanted to share my food with the world. And a lot of folks are under this, this, this thought process of saying, hey, if I do this in this amount of time, then I can achieve this. And that's what's coming into the industry. And just to keep it real with you guys, it's frustrating because we got a lot of, I'm not going to say wannabe chefs, but we got a lot of folks that are reading books that are trying to, dim, trying to um, I guess, mock what they see and not go through the process to really learn for themselves. And it, it does this, this, this industry a disservice because some of us have to hire them. And they come in with ego and they come in with these plans. And I read this and I've done this and I heard this but you've never experienced anything on your own. And I think that's the best lesson in life is to experience it for yourself. So I can really speak to it. Um, no one can tell me um, that climbing a ladder this way is easy, but they can't tell me that it's not fun because I, you got to love it to make it fun. And I love what I do. And that's what made it fun to do. So those 10, 15 years, yes, yeah, reality of number of years, but it didn't feel like it when I was going through the process because I was constantly learning, evolving, be, hanging around good people that really, nurtured me and mentored me in a way that I needed. Well, and I think, you know, having those 10 or 15 years, you know, if you don't have that time, then you never really find your own voice and you kind of just do the stuff that you read in the books or that your, your old boss showed you. But if you actually had that time to learn and grow and try new things, like you have your very clear Aaron McCarthy Jr. voice as it relates to food. 
Yes, and you, you hit that on the head. You could have, I could have said it better. It's, it's your own identity. And every time I, I meet someone, I want to get this. I said, create your own identity. Put in the time to find out what is it that drives you about cooking, drive you, that drives you to want to show up, to put out your best every day. It might not be in the kitchen. It might be writing recipes, but you have no, no desire to want to cook or to make this a full-time job. It might be pastry. It might be uh, saucier. It might be a million things. You might just want to be a butcher, still part of the food, but that's what you want. That's your, that's what you learn and that's what you crave. And that's what you want to share with the world. And that's what, drives you so you can create your own way of butchering and, and and create new techniques and learn from the old techniques and i think that every part of this industry has something that you can make your own if you really settle down and find out what you really want to contribute to the industry and what you really love about it i love that aaron now to talk about your time getting thrust i should say in the limelight and and now you're this media personality, television personality. For those individuals that, let's say, like yourself, were doing it for the right reasons and were in tune with themselves and very passionate, and they're not just doing it for fame and money, for those individuals that want to experience that or get to that level, what what are some of your, what's some of your advice or what's some of the insights that you learned going through that process? I gotta say, um, the number one thing is stay humble. Um, the one thing is always remember that you, you're a human being, like the, the folks that look up to you, the folks that call you role models or um, leaders or mentors, you, you're still a human being at the end of the day. You still, we, I personally, and I know a lot of folks don't agree with this, you still have to answer to God for how you carry yourself, um, your integrity. Um, those things are core values that you, you either have them or you don't. And if you happen to get that opportunity to get the spotlight on you, and you get sucked into the fame of things and get in, sucked into what society tells you you are, you'll lose who you are, man. And, and it's sad to be alone in this world because your real friends, your real family, um, they know who you are. And you want to always be true to yourself. You always want to walk away at the end of the day and lay down at night saying, I am who God created me to be. I am the best me I can be and not who someone else created me to be. Um, secondly, I will always say, take your time. Like, this is a day-by-day process. Today you're up, tomorrow you're down. And I'm sure you guys know a lot of folks have heard of some people, even maybe even experienced yourself, that, um, you know, it's nothing's guaranteed. You know, this is – and you're, you're getting scrutinized for petty things or big things because the eyes of the world is on you. So you better be ready for it because it's not about being perfect, but you got to be able to answer for everything you do in the spotlight and out of the spotlight. And if you do have kids or you have a spouse – You have to respect and understand that they're part of this with you. So you have to not just look out for yourself. You have to look out for the folks that are connected to you. And you got to live in a moment, man. You know, every moment is precious, but it's not to be carried to the next day. I live 24 hours a day. And the next day, I don't know what's guaranteed to me or who's going to want me to speak or to cook or or I won't care about anything about Aaron Hargo Jr. But I know that I can walk away feeling that I've given my best to my craft um, I let that be the number one thing still that, that drives me. It's not the TV. It's not the fame. It's not the accolades. It's the fact that I love cooking, and I appreciate God for the gift. Well, and Aaron, I know that you're you're a, a big support pillar for the community up there in Camden. I feel like you, at the same time, the, the food, the craft definitely drives things, but I feel like you've done a lot to give back to the community there. Maybe you could talk uh, for just a moment about your, your charity organization up there and and maybe the responsibility you feel to give back. You know, it's, it's um, that's my, on my number, that's on my top three list. And it's my, pro- my nonprofit play to win. And it's my, it was, I, I can't take credit for this. We're nine years in. Um, I didn't want to do this. I remember sitting on the toilet back in my small apartment, taking my morning normal routine and, and God said to do this. And I, and I didn't know what it was to play to win. I didn't know why would God trust me to mentor some young men and start a program that I'm going to take these guys and tell them that you have a chance to do and be anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. And I had a flashback moment about when I was getting picked on. I was ashamed to talk about wanting to be a cook. I didn't have the support from the community or my friends, all of my friends, because I, and I knew that I felt alone. I was a loner because no one could relate to what it was to want to cook, to want to feed people. And I said, there's other people like that in the city of Camden that have a drive, they have a passion, they have an idea of what they want to do and they like it. They're just embarrassed or ashamed to say it, whether it's writing poetry 
or creating um, an app or just being able to be a columnist. I, I don't know what it is, but they don't know how to get it out because it's still in the city. There's this expectation of what you should be, uh, whether it's being an athlete, um, being a performer, being an entertainer. But there's a lot of things that and everyone has a gift. And some people don't know how to expose their gift. Um, as parents, they don't know see it in their children. As children, they don't see it in themselves. So Play to Win is an opportunity for young men to come together from the age of, we follow them for 10 years. Um, we get them in the ninth grade and we follow them. We just pursue what they're passionate about. And it's all about exposing it and getting them the support group and then that arena that will help them become what they choose to be that's passionate, that they're passionate about and not having someone tag them with, hey, you must go to college. You must take this trade. You must do this because it's about the money. The money will come. And I think, Sean, I said this before, the money will come. You, you just got to put the time in and love doing what you do. It, it, it's inevitable that it'll come. And it'll be just what you need to survive if you, you, you just stick to the course. And Play to Win is all about helping these young men understand that, hey, you have support. You got somebody that's been where you are that felt the way you felt, that's from the same neighborhood. I know the challenges. I know the temptations. I know the peer pressure. But I can tell you that if you stay focused and you, and you trust God and, and trust that you really love this this thing that you want to do, that you, you will make it. And that's what Play to Win is all about. And I can't give enough because um, I just think it's a privilege to be able to touch someone's life and be able to have them look at you and, and know that you're going to have their back and be there for the long haul. Um, through high school, through through all the, 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 the adversities and help them see their way to their future. Love that, Aaron. And, you know, some uh, reflecting back on some of the studies that I read, because I constantly get those, but some of the most successful and happiest individuals have a direct connection to community and to giving back. And I, I can imagine for you that if you do hit any tough periods that you can reflect on that work that you do and it just drives you, right? Yes. Yes. It man, I'm telling you to see these boys show up. It's what drives me. Like I'm not crazy. They really know that this is going to help them. And, and, and I have down days, man. I have a lot of down days. I doubt myself a lot. I mean, I'm a human being and I got blood running through my veins. So it's not like I'm on my A game every day, but to hear these guys say, Hey chef, what we eating for lunch? Chef, I was talking to my mom and I told her I love her. Chef, you know, I'm, I'm having problems, you know, in school. And just talking to me, like, they know that I'm their friend. It, 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 they don't know how much they do for me. I mean, I think that they think they're getting the, they're getting the best of this deal. But honestly, you, you hit it on the head. I'm, I'm getting the best of this deal all the way around the clock. So I, I have nothing but happiness in my heart about this, this program and, and what I'm doing. Wow, I I'm love curious. it. And, now, and now, now he turns selfish on us. It's all about him now. It's not the truth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's selfish pride. Don't worry, America. <laughs> That's right. Aaron, I'm curious. For you, uh, the play to win the game, what does that mean? To me, I, I, think of, I think of Herm Edwards, you play to win the game. Yeah. Getting all fired up in the press conference. But what, what does that mean to you? And you brought up Harm Edwards, one of my favorites. Uh, I love his passion in life. Um, play to win is all about knowing that you got you to gotta put in your time. You know, whatever it is, you got to put in your time. We mentioned the 10,000 hours, but you got to put in your time to whatever you put your heart to. And, and you can't quit. You, you, th- there is no option. There is no option. You got to play at this. You got to, and, and when I say play at this, a lot of the boys when they came in, they thought we were going to start a basketball league. I'm like, nah. You got to know that you can't quit. You can't go sit on a bench. There is no a uh, six man. You're the five. So we're on this. To, we're in this together, and we're in this to win in life. We're in this to say that whatever period, quarter, inning that we are in life, that we're going to put 110 percent in to win. And you got to know that you got to have a passion and a desire, and you got to drive yourself and be happy about it, regardless of what's coming at you. You got to be happy to know that I'm going to win at this. There's no way I'm going to lose. There is no options. I'm going to win. It might take me forever. We might have to run over time over and over and over again. But at the end of the day, if it's by one point or, 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 or two, we're going to win. And that's what play to win is all about, is making sure that these young guys understand that we don't have an option to quit and turn back. You know, those days are over. So when you got support and you got someone believing in you more than you, we got a problem because you got to believe in yourself more than the person that's supporting you. And that's what play to win is all about. 
is making sure that these guys don't ever think about quitting, don't ever think about them being failures, don't ever think about, yeah, we will have failures, but that doesn't identify you as a failure. So they have to wrap that around their mind and, and their heart to know that there's going to be up and downs. There's going to be slow periods. There's going to be times that we're down by 10, but we still got a chance to win as long as that clock is ticking. And as long as you got air in your lungs, the clock is ticking, brother. So keep on playing the game. Love it. So to change gears just for a moment, as you were starting to experience success with, let's say, Food Network, and so then you, I don't know exactly when, but you launched the sauce, which is one of your uh, products, if you will. But how did you start thinking differently about business, about your career, about diversifying yourself, your your expertise, your experience? Um, how did you start thinking about that to then open up to opportunities? It, it was all about thinking about the ground level folk. Um, it, as a chef, I don't try to appeal to the Manhattan crowd. Um, I think that if, if they're to eat my food, they'll love it. But it's about the common folk that want to appreciate good food and, and, and not feel intimidated by what it is. And that's how I look at products that I create. I'm thinking about the everyday mom and dad. I'm thinking about the teenager. I'm thinking about the elderly. I'm thinking about those that have restrictions in their diets. I'm thinking about all those folks that can't appreciate the, the rich things in life. And, and not rich in money, but the, the, the more upper class things that people say you should have or need to appreciate it. And so when I created the sauce, I thought primarily of my own family and my wife. My wife's a very talented, smart woman that doesn't cook. She doesn't like the kitchen. She feels like it's intimidating. And I know she's not the only person, but she loves great food. And when I thought about the sauce, I'm like, what can I do to put, and what can I make as a condiment or as an enhancer, food enhancer, or something that can make cooking easy so that anyone can walk in and be a novice and be scared as crap but know that if you take a scoop of this sauce and add it to any protein, veggie, or starch, it's going to give you the best flavor and have it consistent. And you guys know as, as chefs and in the industry and in diner and eaters that consistency is key. And I thought that if I can give something to the world to say this is something that can make cooking easy and it can be consistent and taste great and be good for my family because it's, it's just pure natural goodness, then that's what I want to do. And my wife was my first, you know, as I say, not test dummy, but she was my first tester that said, hey, you know what? This works. And she's been in the kitchen ever since. And my kids get in the kitchen and all they need is the sauce. And I've talked to the elderly and all they need is the sauce. I've given the sauce to my nonprofit when they went off to college. I'm like, yo, you got a microwave? You got water? You got the sauce? Dude, you can rock out a meal. And then we started creating videos and menus and things of that nature so folks can really learn how to make good food at home consistently and easy and i pray that all my products are able to be for the common folks that want to just have restaurant style great food without going through all the hassle the stress and the fear of making it i love that that sounds great for uh for you now aaron you know i get to i get to see you every so often sunday night on on bar rescue with uh, mr taffer which is always entertaining uh, you know, aside from that, uh, how do you occupy your days uh, for the most part right now? Uh, for the most part right now, uh, my, my primary focus is uh, my family. I've been able to have some time to spend with my kids. Um, my three kids and my youngest two are t in teenage years. So this is very precious and valuable to me. I, I'm so blessed to be able to, to see them and to talk to them and watch them grow. Um, I'm also spending more time with my nonprofit and also pursuing uh, and promoting the sauce. And, and as of like three weeks ago, I started the Facebook Live and uh, on Wednesdays and Fridays where I go and really expose those restaurants and eateries and mom and pop shops that have something great to offer that folks in their neighborhood um, know about, but a lot of folks don't. So I've been just hitting up spots and talking to the chefs and the owners and really it's called Real Talk Food Talk with AMJ trying to get in the behind the scenes so folks can see how things are made, get to know the passion behind the food um, and get to taste it through me. And I can validate this person as really having great grub in their hood. And this is where you need to go to check it out. So we can start getting folks to support a lot of restaurants and eateries that aren't getting that support unless you're here, heard about through a famous celebrity or you're heard about through you know, a, a newspaper article that might have hit your town, but 
I'm here to expose that all over the country and use my platform to have folks that when they do travel or when they're looking for something unique, whether it's in Camden or whether it's in some parts of Jersey, Philly or wherever, all over the country, this is where you need to go. This is what you need to try out. And AMJ says the bomb. So go ahead and, and, and get a taste of it. So, Aaron, you have your hands in a couple of different things. You're, you're balancing life and family and business and the different career moves. So are there are there productivity principles that you have? Are there ways that you structure your time, your day to be effective? Yes, that's key. Uh, I have a uh, I, got, I can't do it on my own. I have a great assistant that really helps me in all these projects so that I can keep my schedule um, balance because I believe in life. If you don't have balance, man, you're going to get stressed and you're going to get crazy and you're not going to be able to enjoy what you do. So I make sure that my weekends with my nonprofit are set aside. I make sure that my family time, when my kids come home, if I'm in town, I'm with them. I selected my two days of the week that's committed to my Facebook Live, um, Real Talk, Food Talk. And I also leave open space for appearing on Bar Rescue, and which I get enough notice and time to do that. And whatever type of fundraising opportunities that I can do that doesn't take away from my family time and my personal time and my God time, I try to, to participate in those things as well. And the sauce is the sauce. So, you know, I, I, I'm i like Jay-Z. I ride around with it in my car. So <laughs> <laughs> the sauce and the spice, a brother can hook you up on the spot. But, you know, um, I have great people around me. And I always say that you need a support team and support system to make things like this happen and, and keep a balanced life. And so I can't take credit um, for anything, but knowing that God has given me, blessed me with great people to help me along this, this uh, journey. And Chris, let me jump in really quick, just to clarify for anyone listening, the sauce, that's the actual name of the sauce, right? Yeah. So, so, so when you hear him say, I ride around with the sauce, you know, some people are thinking, well, what's it called? I want to look it up. No, it's called the sauce. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the sauce. Uh, so for anybody, for anybody who wants to know. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the sauce and the spice, they're sisters and brothers. So the spice is the dry formula of the sauce. And like you said, the sauce is the title because when, when I created it, my brother was like, yo, man, this is banging. What kind of sauce is it? I'm like, it's not a sauce. He's like, but what is it? I'm like, it's a kind of, it's a food in hand. I don't know. He's like, yo, the sauce is bomb. I'm like, all right, the sauce it is. I'm like, so we named it the sauce. It does everything. So thanks for clarifying that. Back to what you're just talking about. It sounds like for you, it's, it's helped to kind of car- compartmentalize things in, in your life, right? Yes. If, if I didn't, and I've been where I didn't, I'm going to keep it real with you guys. I was chaotic. I was overstressed. I was trying to grab too much at one time. And honestly, um, I don't know, you probably don't know, but a lot of my fans, have been, I, I went off the radar, man, for a long time with social media. And I'm not a big social media guy. My team is helping me. I'm learning this and keep up. But I had to go to, off the radar and just and just get by myself, you know, and it was forced. It wasn't something I chose, but things were falling out of, it were, were just just spiraling out of control. And, and I had to breathe and I had to take time to, to meditate and to, to go back to the ground zero, to the basics and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where am I supposed to be most effective? Um, how do I find joy in everything I'm doing? Because it, it, it got a little bit overwhelming and it's because I was listening to too many thoughts in my head and too many people that had good intentions, but I just said no, and I, and I got into panic mode. You know, I wanted so much because the, the train was moving at such a fast pace. And I had to understand that I had to slow the train down. And if I didn't, someone was going to slow it down for me. And luckily, I was able to, to just go off the radar, you know, take a sabbatical and just really regroup. And I feel 10,000 times better about my life today, uh, about the things I'm doing, about the participation. And I learned how to say no to a lot of things. And I learned that you can't make everyone happy. So um, it, it's been such a, a learning experience to know that for anybody out there, um, take it one day at a time, man. It's real talk. You know, you touch on something right there at the end when you said you learned to say no. I think it's super invaluable for the audience that we have because a lot of them have a tilt towards entrepreneurship. So can you just elaborate on that, on, on the power of saying no and why that's so important for someone in your position because what what happened is folks look at you and they they see something they sense that goodness they sense that gift they sense that talent and then it's like an epidemic if someone knows it and they hear it and then in the atmosphere in the universe someone else gets the wind of it 
And then you start to build up this happiness and this joy, like, wow, I've arrived. This is good. This is what I've always wanted. And then the, it doesn't stop. And then it, it keeps spreading like wildfire. And before you know it, you have all this attention or you have these things happening and all these opportunities that are great that could advance your life and change your lifestyle uh, dramatically and make things happen for you that you always wanted to happen. But you never take time for yourself. And you start saying yes, 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 yes. And then you bombard your schedule. And not just your schedule as far as time, but you start to lose time for yourself. You start to lose time to hear quietness because you're so busy trying to please everyone. And then you find yourself saying, if I don't say yes, I'm going to lose out. And if I don't say yes, I'm going to miss this opportunity. But I, I'm a true believer in that what's for you is for you. And it'll come back around. You just got to learn to say no at some time and, and really um, – you got to prioritize, you know, and you got to understand that you can't do everything in 24 hours of a day. You can't make commitments to everyone that's going to promise you the stars in the, in the sky. You can't chase after the dollar. You just have to really just take time to settle yourself um, because you, you will miss out on enjoying everything um, all for the sake of saying yes to everyone. And they will t treat you just like, but yes, hey, you did the work. We're done with you be gone, you know, and that hurts more than anything to know that they don't even remember your name. I was blessed to hear that you wanted to do this podcast um, interview with me because we had such a great time last time and I enjoyed everything about you, man. You're a real dude. You're solid. Um, it's real talk with you. Um, up to this day, you, you're, you're one of my top, if not the top interviews I've ever done um, because of the, the feel that you give and the energy. Um, and I really enjoy it. And so, this is what's, what it's all about. You know, I have other things on the plate that I can be doing right now, but this was a priority because I enjoyed the energy and, and what comes from it. Ah, oh, that's great, Aaron. And, and, and right back at you, ditto. You got it, brother. Aaron, his, his head's big enough already. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we we just we just installed new doorways in my house just to get through. <laughs> well, we'll be starting these twins, and I'll come walk with you. But we we won't well, talk. We'll, we'll just walk in in silence. Uh, two introverts walking <laughs> along inside each other. Uh, it's great. We well, well, you know, Aaron, just to kind of touch back, and, and maybe we can wrap things up here in a minute. But just touch back on what you're speaking of. You know, I think, you know. I've been myself in similar situations where you start to get a little bit of attention and especially you, you going from, you know, you had the, the, the day job to, you know, next food network star and you start getting all these opportunities. And at least for me, my mindset was, well, if I don't take these opportunities, they won't come back around like you mentioned, but also maybe they'll kind of start to forget about me. Did anything like that go through your mind? Oh man, if I didn't have those thoughts a million and one times, that that is the most, it, it still is on some days, the scariest thought that they will forget about me and I, they won't even request me or they won't even check in to see if I'm breathing or not. But I had to understand that when you do something right the first time out the box, when you be you, people will never forget about you. They will always seek you. They will always find you because people want genuine, organic folks at the end of the day. And there's a good amount of folks that can care less about the organic person of you. But I had to put those fears aside, and I'm still working on it. I'm not, I haven't perfected it, to know that they do want to know about Aaron McCarville Jr. They do want to see what I'm doing. They do want to see what kind of food I'm creating, where I'm at, when I'm tasting. They do want to know about what I'm doing. And that's what I have to feed myself as thoughts and confirmation that, I've left a good impression on people. And that's what I, I aim to do is to leave a good, honest impression on folks that those that forget about me was meant to be. And it's not something I can control. And those that remember me, um, it's a blessing because obviously I've touched their life in a way that they can relate to me. So that, that's and, my, my model. And that top 10 percent that really connects with you, that really loves Aaron McCargo Jr., you, your smile, your laugh, like your personality. Those are the ones that kind of help carry the torch forward as well. Oh man, you said it. They they really do. And and you did you know, I can't say anything, man. You hit that. That's that's just what it is. That's just what it is. That 10%, man. It's that it's like I look at my nonprofit. If one makes it, I'm solid. If one gets it, I'm good. It's all that's all that matters. Love that, Aaron. Now I do have a a question that did pop in my mind, and I'm very curious. You're someone that has done interviews you've had press written up about you you've had restaurants so you've had reviews on those restaurants is there a time maybe it was one p 
piece of press that was written that just took the wind out of your sails. You read it, it hit you hard, it knocked you down. What was that? What was your reaction? How did you kind of get through that? Because the reason I'm asking is, is as people find success, they do get negative press and feedback and I really want to understand how you processed it. I'm going to tell you, it was two times in my life thus far that has happened. One was the incident with Paula Dean. Um, I went on to say that Paula Dean is a good person. Um, she treated me with respect. I hung out with her at her home. I, I was on her show and we shared the same producers. Never had, you know, any bad blood or bad experiences with Paula Dean. And that I don't think that everyone should jump on this bandwagon as, as judging her and they don't know her. And I said, I wouldn't want no one to judge me based on something that was said or something that could have happened or didn't happen and not know who I am. And I teach my kids that unless you're there, don't you respond to it. Don't you follow the bandwagon. And so I got so much, you know, last back about here I am a black man, you know, the N word was thrown out there. I'm looking at it and it was just a whole TMZ nonsense thing. And folks were like looking at me sideways, but I had to speak my truth, man, because I wouldn't want no one slandering me and, and, and saying things that you don't even know me, but because you heard it, you know, you're ruining my reputation, my opportunity to make money for my family and whatever else it might be. And the other thing was when I won next school network star, I read an article and heard someone, um, someone mentioned that it was a pity case that I really shouldn't have won. I wasn't the most talented. And that my sob story from Camden was why I won. And those two hit me to the core for a second because I had to realize these folks don't even know me. And they're sitting behind their computers or sitting wherever they are standing, making a statement based on their opinions. Um, but if they were to meet me face to face, A, they would love me or will we be fighting? Or B, they would feel really ashamed and sad to say what they've said about me because it's not true. Um, I, I love people in general. I love life. I don't look to take anything from anyone. I don't look to, to um, be negative towards anyone. And, and I stick by what I believe in, man. So the, the only way I was able to bounce back was to understand who I am. I had to know who I was. And I said, if you know who you truly are, you know who the core you are, and you know what your integrity and what you stand for and it's all about, and you could just wash, throw it out the window as just an opinion. And that's just what I chose to do, is throw those things out of opinion and trust that 10% around me that knows Aaron McCargo Jr. and what I stand for. That's good stuff. Yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, just the world we live in, even you, you see people you know, hop on a Facebook Live and leave a, a comment that's just so unnecessary. I think, unfortunately, that's kind of the world we live in. But you obviously have an opportunity to respond the way that, that uh, feels right to you. And I think uh, bravo to you for that. Aaron, and wrapping up, any kind of final words of, of advice uh, for the listeners that are maybe starting out or maybe in the middle of the road that you know, they're trying to make it? Um, you know what? I will always say these things. I'm like, uh, first, you got to believe in yourself. Believe in, in yourself and really be able to take constructive criticism. And whatever product or project you're going to start, run it by someone that you really can appreciate and respect their opinions about you that are, aren't going to be yes people, but going to be honest people. Um, because even though you can have all the belief in yourself about what you're going to do, you got to make sure you got something that that's, that's worthy for the audience that you're going to try to sell it to, to appreciate, um, to write it down. You know, you got to write down the vision, write down a plan, um, not just a business plan, but write down a plan, write down what you see and, and look at it and make sure it's realistic to you and make sure it's, it's, it's not that you can accomplish it because a lot of things you can accomplish by yourself, but you can accomplish with others. But you have to make sure you write it down and look at it. And then understand um, at the end of the day that, and this is my personal belief, that if you don't put God in, in part of everything you do, you're going to have a very slim chance, not to say they won't happen, but of it really being a great experience. And I think that that's been my key to success is knowing that each and every day I live in the moment. I trust God for what's going to happen. And I look at my plan. I trust the people around me when I have an idea to give me the 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 go or not go sign. And I always believe in myself that every intention of mine is to just do something better to make the world a better place.
Aaron, it was well said. So much value. I know a lot of people are going to hear this and a lot of different parts are going to resonate with them. Thank you so much for taking the time to connect with us today. That's all, Chris. Thank you, guys. Be blessed, man. Have a good one now. You too, buddy. So that was our conversation with Aaron McCargo Jr. Sean, that was a lot of fun. What were your takeaways? First, I love Aaron. He's just such a good guy. I mean, you can just feel his energy. Uh, just just a great guy. You know, there was obviously a, a lot of things that we talked about, and there was a lot of great takeaways. Two in particular for me was toward the end. I really enjoyed when he said that he had to learn how to say no, essentially. It's very easy to go in a thousand different directions and start trying to do all of these different things and potentially appeal to a lot of different people that might be tugging at you. But your time is the most precious thing and you protect your time by saying no to certain things. You know, And I know it's a fine balance because as you discussed with him, the, there's a fear built in that if you say no, then all of a sudden you may lose your relevancy and people won't ask anymore. But I think it's how you say no. Learning how to control your time saying no, but saying it in a way that still leaves that door open for that other individual, potentially, if that's the scenario. I think that was important. And I think another one was how do you deal with negative press and how do you deal with negative reviews? I think that's very... Um, that's tough in business is to to maybe build something that's your own baby and have people to talk negative about you or just you being you as an individual, right? Aaron was just expressing himself as an individual based upon his experience and people started attacking him. Uh, that's, that's, that's tough. That's very tough to handle. And I think it's, like you said, Chris, it's a societal thing. It's easy for people to just fire shots behind a computer, but man, I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to say something negative to Aaron and stand in front of him in real life. I mean, he's not a small dude, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I, I think, I think those are, those are two things that I liked in our conversation. What about you? Yeah. And then, like you started talking at the beginning, he, uh, he's a great guy, a lot of fun. You know, I think there's a lot that I took away. I really enjoy, enjoyed hearing him talk about, you know, as a, as a, an industry, we've kind of, gotten away from the, you know, put in the grunt work, you know, working, you know, for however many years up your, up your way up the line to kind of figure things out to where then you have a chance to kind of do it for yourself. And, you know, him talking about how, if you really embrace that time, you're able to not only learn, but you're also able to kind of develop this sense of, of what kind of art and what type of the craft that you want to put out there to the world. And it's really only through those years and through that slugging it out, you know, day after day, year after year that you kind of figure out for yourself what it is you want to do. And like, you know, for him, he found something that was very kind of unique to him. He, he wasn't trying to, like you mentioned a few minutes ago, Sean, he wasn't trying to uh, uh, appease everybody and make everybody happy, but he found the, the, the food that he wanted to cook and stuck to his guns and as a result, has been really successful in doing so. So you guys let us know what you think. Uh, we had a blast uh, chatting with uh, Chef Aaron McCargo Jr. Let him know on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever it is that you uh, connect on social media. And now just one final quote from Chef Aaron McCargo from his interview with Sean from Entrepreneurial Chef. It's all about networking through word of mouth and making sure that your first impression is your best impression. And with that, we're signing off.